Grand Portage Resources Herbert Gold Project in Southeast Alaska highlights increased gold resource indicated and inferred of 860,000 ounces in excess of 10 grams per ton gold. Expansion drilling is planned on the Herbert Gold property for the summer of 2019. Grand Portage Resources trading symbols are GPG on the TSX Venture, GPTRF on the OTCQB, and GPB on Frankfurt. For more information, please visit our website, grandportage.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Stuart Muir, Executive Director of the Resource Work Society. Welcome back to the show, Stuart. Thank you, Jim. Stuart, I guess uh, kudos uh, to your office here. Resource Works named one of the top 50 energy influencers in Canada in just five years of existence. What did you do and what's the uh, acknowledgement from? Oh, well, th- th- thanks, Jim. We've been doing our little group. I mean, when I say little, we, we are a very small team. And the thing is, we're quite focused on natural resources. Our, our goal has been to showcase talk about, learn more about the province of British Columbia's resource sectors and what it means for personal well-being. How do we correlate that to the environment, climate, all these things, the jobs that come from it, the incomes, the First Nations aspirations for having a better life, all these things. It's actually kind of a hot space, you know. There's so many issues in this. But we set out five years ago to try to make a difference in that. And I got some people to support me in doing this. I've got a very small but talented and incredibly passionate team. I've got volunteers who are coming to me all the time and saying, this is important work, how can I help? So I try to find things for people like that to do. And, you know, if they go to resourceworks.com, anyone who's interested in this, they can find us and get in touch if they're interested in that. But uh, what did we do? That's a good question because we we felt that there was a lack of information, first of all. Um, you know, you see reports from the government and think tanks and Maybe the facts and figures are kind of out there, but often it's so technical and it's, you know, they'll publish hundreds of pages on some, some narrow topic and it never really gets into people's faces because we're also busy doing things. I don't, I don't blame anyone for not having information on, on, on the economy because there's so much else going on, but I still felt how can we, and I'm like you, my background is in journalism storytelling, finding the facts, getting the facts to people in a meaningful way when it matters. So how do we get that kind of information in front of people? So that's what we've done. You know, we've done some research. We do some reports. We seek to um, just find out what's what's going on, whether it's LNG or pipelines or forestry, mining, even aquaculture fits in. We've done reports on all of these things. And uh, we also try to bring it out there into a more respectful values based discussion you know everywhere i see these screaming matches got people over there and then the, their opponents way over there and they're kind of hollering at each other whether it's in social media or on the streets you know that just tur- it's a turn off it's a turn off for everyone you know we we want to see a better discussion so really those are the underlying things so finally 5 years into this which is feels like a long time in some ways but if you're building a new organization, a new business, um, a new enterprise like ours, it's not that long a time. It flew past. So we just got recognized by a group uh, out of UVic, University of Alberta. Their their goal was to look at who's influential in energy, particularly they wanted to narrow in on the fossil fuel or hydrocarbon space, find out who's who are the groups, who are the organizations that are making a difference. And they found, like, the National Energy Board, they found um, some of the big banks who've got, uh, I guess, economic units who talk about this stuff, and they put ResourceWorks on their top 50 list. So that was pretty incredible to be in that company, and we're really pleased about it. Are you worried that places like the city of Victoria might sue you because you're saying, you know, there's nothing wrong with fossil fuel development if it's done in a respectful, uh, uh, eco-friendly way? Oh, I think that would be a great lawsuit. Now, personally, I think Victorians, I mean, I live in Victoria. I see them, you know, they just opened a new Maserati dealership in the Victoria. Last time I heard those weren't running on, on, you know, unicorn emissions. They were running on gas, gasoline. 
and the city of Victoria gave a permit to it. I actually looked it up. They gave a, a business permit. They gave a development permit to build a building for a brand new shiny Maserati dealership right out there on Douglas Street uh, that goes up to Highway 1. Um, you know, I think that sort of finger pointing, which is still in fashion, you know, we have this climate litigation stuff. Municipalities are being asked to sue the oil company of the Soviet Union. Now, Jim, I know that the Soviet Union died 30 years ago, but they're actually, <laughs> municipalities are actually being pressured to write letters to groups like that and the oil company of Iraq and Iran and Exxon and, and companies to demand money. I mean, it's, you, you can just imagine what such letters will be received as. Um, and I've seen some of the responses actually. They're, they're incredibly polite and well informed when they come back from the oil companies who do respond. But, you know, this idea that you, you have to sue people or shut them down or that kind of thing is not where the public is at. You know, people are, we did a couple of surveys. We worked with Ipsos to find out, you know, 80% of British Columbia residents want to have responsible resource development. They're, they're supportive of that. And so the question is, how do you do it properly? You know, it's not should we or shouldn't we have energy in our lives because 75% of the energy in everyone's life, I don't care if you ride a bicycle and only eat, uh, you know, vegan tofu, you still are in the energy consumption world, unless you live in a cave somewhere, I guess. But uh, for the rest of us, three-quarters of the energy we, we use is from fossil fuels today. And the idea that we just sort of stop doing that tomorrow, well, there's no one who realistically can say that that's possible. So, uh, good question, though. Victoria, I think actually the mayor's great. There's a mayor who's um, all in favor of backyard chickens. My cousin's got backyard chickens. I was over at her house. She she comes in, three three chickens. I mean, three three eggs from the chicken fresh on the table a couple of mornings ago. Lots of people in Victoria do that. It's a fun thing. The mayor does that. She rides her bike around, goes to the office on her bike. Great exponent of lower your impact on the environment. But she's also practical and reasonable. You know, she actually said um, this whole climate litigation thing, you've been seeing the city of Vancouver wants to do that. She actually said, no, that's a dumb idea. We need to work with people who have the solutions. Scientists, technologists, industry, work together, not try to sue them. So, actually, I'm, I'm really impressed by some of the municipal leadership we have. Sometimes now, not as obvious, but it's there. Now, I wonder, because the people getting rich off all of this are the lawyers to the law firms oh, that God, yes. launch these mm-hmm. lawsuits uh, on behalf of cities against pipelines and uh, oil companies and so on. Are they big contributors to the election campaigns of these city councillors? Oh, that's a good question. You know, I think in B.C., unlike some parts of the country, there's... There's not a lot of, of transparency on that. I haven't done a lot of research. Um, I, I, I think that there there may be that, but um, one thing I'm certainly confident about is that this whole litigation thing is a is a bonanza for lawyers. So you look at the city of Burnaby. You know, you'd think that uh, with the Trans Mountain Pipeline, for example, after all of the legal challenges, the determinations uh, we, we've seen uh, after the Federal Court of Appeals. Conditions were satisfied by the federal government. Now they're moving ahead again. That you know, smart people who deal with tax dollars, residents paying their their property taxes, would use that to maybe build some swimming pools or fill some potholes, all that, all that uh, stuff that cities are meant to do. But no, no, there's the city of Burnaby out there again spending money. I had a look at the legal uh, thesis that they're pursuing now, and it's just it's it's just. Uh, reduced to the most absurd kind of things that they're following. And you just, you can just see the lawyers, okay, got another Porsche coming, away we go. I, I suppose maybe the benefit is they could be driving a new, say, electric Jaguar, because there's a new one coming out. So if there's a benefit, maybe, maybe those lawyers will be bu- buying electric cars and, and they'll be doing their bit to save the environment. But it will be with taxpayers' dollars that could have been spent on, you know, new fire hydrants or improving the the wastewater systems, or whatever else they need to do. Well, from that's what a, that's a political choice, unfortunately. Well, from what I understand, there are limits on what municipal uh, election campaigns can collect during an election year, but there's no limit outside of the election year. So they can pile up as much money as they want uh, mm-hmm. years before the next election. Yeah. Well, 
you know, I have in my work encountered a lot of the councillors and mayors around BC, and one thing I I find generally is the apart from how, however they got elected, there is uh, quite a sense of responsibility. They have a lot of work to do. They don't get paid a lot, but enormous number of hours they have to prepare for committees. They've got to read just stacks of documents to be on top of it, and they're expected to be sharp and performing on every single file, and they might have hundreds of things. So, um, you know, if, if they've got to get their dollars to get elected and buy signs or whatever from different sources, as long as it's done, you know, it's kosher, I, I'm okay with, with them raising their donations that way. But uh, I guess we have those laws for a reason, and I, I'm sure they're broadly respected. We'll have more with Stuart Muir right after this. Hi, I'm Douglas Mason, President and CEO of Magnum Gold Corp, MGI and the TSX Venture Exchange. A 2015 drill program on the LH property intersected several high-grade gold intersections, including 11 meters of 20.66 grams per ton gold. Additional drill targets on the LH property have been identified by a 2018 drone airborne magnetic survey to further evaluate a pyrotite enriched gold bearing system. Please visit our website at magnumgoldcorp.com. Media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, Recycling Trade Publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Welcome back. We're speaking with Stuart Muir. Stuart, yet another court challenge to the Trans Mountain Pipeline, even though uh, the federal cabinet approved it, the National Energy Board approved it. They feel they felt they met the guidelines set by the Court of Appeal for it. What's your uh, take on this uh, renewed legal effort against it? Yeah, well, I think it's pretty much uh, as predictable as the sun rises in the morning, that especially in B.C., any desirable economic development project will be opposed by somebody. Trans Mountain has been particularly magnetic as an attractant to this litigation. So we saw, of course, immediately three groups came out, three groups that have a sort of legal and environmental agenda to uh, pursue. I've lost track. Is it the 18th or 19th lawsuit? Um, all but one of which have failed. Uh, but I guess it signifies that they have a lot of money to spend on lawyers. Um, they can fundraise on these issues. I think where it's it's grabbed the emotion of the public, you know, we see that that girl from Sweden who who is uh, I, th- I think moving people through her communications program, and and that gets people writing checks. So there's dollars to do this kind of legal work. Um, you know, in some ways, I've supported it because I think that when you challenge something and it's a good something, you make it stronger. You know, I think with the Trans Mountain approval, they had 156 or seven conditions, all of which have to be legally met. Most of those came about because there were civic society groups that came to the process and said, hey, we've got a concern about this. Maybe it's, you know, potential for leakage or emissions or spills, and we just want to make sure that it's done right. And that made for a better project. And I, I've said before, and I, no one has said I'm wrong, that as a result of that, and further conditions recently imposed, 16 of them, we now have, in Trans Mountain Expansion, the world's best pipeline. Because its standards have been just torqued up, thanks to public pressure. Now, once you've achieved that status, which we have, and you're still fighting it, I think that's a different thing. So I think these groups, when they say they're about making the pipeline safer, but it's already been made the best possible, that's when you really have to start to question what their true intention is. So, so I think, you know, that's, that's growing in the, the public's, uh, analysis as well. It's not mu- just me saying it with my point of view. And I, I, I can say that because I've seen three polls recently. One of them was done with the support of my group, we asked a prominent national, international pollster, Ipsos, to come in and study the public mind in BC on Trans Mountain just for the decision. They found 60% of residents were in favor. They found that on Vancouver Island, 
the same number of people were in favor. That was a big surprise because Vancouver Island, we often associate with, with that more kind of green wing. You know, they have Elizabeth May over there. Um, but no, they're just as supportive as anyone else. And also the highest educated people are supportive of it. And not only did we see that result, but a few days later, there was another poll came out, very similar broad resort, result. And then a, a, just a few days ago, we had a third one. Again, it's all around that 60% mark. So it's not everybody. It never is. But 60%, when you have that consistently over time, and we had it you know, in the past as well, that level, I think it shows that people are just, they're kind of wearily determined. You know, let's get on with it. And so this week we've had uh, these groups coming out to fight again. It, it's starting to look a little like that, uh, what's that image from the Bat of La Mancha, tilting at the windmill. They're just doing it because they don't know what else to do. They don't know um, anything beyond that. It's just, it's what they do. It's got a sort of uh, predictability. The clockwork is running. They've been switched on, and so they must go and sue. Does it have any bearing on the project? I don't think so. I think these will, will be very quickly analyzed, because at this point, there's no further improvements that can be made in this project. Is it encouraging that two Aboriginal groups say they are taking a look at buying either uh, at least half of the project or perhaps the entire pipeline? Well, what, one of the effects of this process is that I think it is, it is if you will, forced the development of some of the things that were already happening in the indigenous self-realization movement, economic self-realization in particular, to deal with some of the structural impediments. You know, just imagine that you're an indigenous person. You live on a reserve that's been allocated to your group from the government 100 years ago. Uh, you, you go to get a mortgage on your house to build a house, say. The bank says, hey, you can't have any... Uh, any money because we couldn't come and repossess that house if you defaulted. So we're not going to loan you any any money. Is it any wonder that First Nations have had a housing crisis for generations? They 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 can't you know do what others can do. So things like that where where First Nations don't have borrowing ability and can't leverage their assets. That's a huge problem. It's a very technical problem. It's been to some extent addressed. I don't think fully. It's baked into the Indian Act, and th th that relic is still driving these problems. <clears throat> but what I've found is that in the last few years, the number of, of incredibly focused, enabled, educated, driven, young rising leaders of First Nations from across Canada that I've met, it blows your mind how capable and determined this group is to succeed. And so uh, I think TMX is kind of a, big shiny object that's appeared, it's maybe galvanized or accelerated the the determination of some of these leaders to, to really get in there and overcome. Because the reason for doing it, it's not just let's do it because we can, it's do it because it's the path away from poverty. It's a way to get uh, long-term income. The thing about pipelines is they are just wonderful dividend holds. If you have one in your portfolio, everyone does, even if you don't you know, own directly your RRSP, unless you've constructed a portfolio that is, you know, deliberately to exclude them, you've probably got pipelines because they produce dividends steadily over time. And so they're, they're a good way to contribute to your, your later life income. Um, and, and that's also why uh, a First Nation government would want to have it because they need steady income in order to fund the programs, and that's what it does. So as long as they can get the... You know, the funding deal in place, uh, it's going to take a lot of help. It's a big stretch. And this is a, if this happens, it will be a historic turning point for how First Nations in Canada, Indigenous people in general, including Métis, are able to engage in the wide economy. And it will be all to the good for Canadians. We'll have more from Stuart Muir right after this. I'm Douglas Mason, CEO of Naturally Splendid, symbol NSP on the TSX Venture Exchange. Naturally Splendid is a biotechnology and consumer products company focused on the global cannabis and health markets. Naturally Splendid is expanding distribution in this rapidly growing market with products currently in Canada, the USA, South Korea, Germany, and Australia. To view our comprehensive company presentation and for more information, please visit our website at naturallysplendid.com. 
Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Stuart Muir. Stuart, I did a double take when I saw a report that said natural gas, liquefied natural gas, is as bad as coal. What's behind that? Yeah, I think there's maybe a little bit of coordination. There were, there were a few reports last week. Um, and where did it come from? Why Why all of these different at one time? I, I think there's maybe a, a coordinated push, maybe the uh, anti-LNG movement to say, okay, we've got to get a report out there and start talking about it so we can we can uh, uh, deal with this problem, which is that people are starting to realize that natural gas is a great fuel alternative. It is helping to create uh, lower emissions around the world. It's helping to create uh, more prosperous BC. These things are a big threat to some environmental movements. I know that sounds like a, why, why would I say that? Uh, I, I think it's a, it's a threat because it, natural gas is a fossil fuel. And uh, if you take a very fundamentalist approach to our energy diet, you would say you've got to cut out all the fossil fuels. That, that's what we hear from a lot of people um, who don't want to talk about the fact that 75% of all the energy we use is from fossil fuels. So even though it's desirable to reduce that, you can't just do it over time because you'd starve if that was your diet reduced to only 25%. Um, some people want us to do that. David Suzuki is out there. Uh, today, he published an article saying that uh, <clears throat> it's it's twisted logic to to say that there's anything good in uh, in natural gas, uh, and, and we need to uh, get on to just green energy right away. Um, a lot of misstatements, though, in that report, and that's the thing about it. If it was true, if it was true, hey, we should be looking at that. Um, I've looked at all the claims made, and it's it's almost, I would say. And I'm not the only one saying this. Uh, Blair King has written a blog post about it in great detail. He's a scientist, PhD. He's got a PhD in science. I don't. Um, and we're saying the same thing. We've looked at the evidence, and almost none of it stands up to any basic analysis. They've they've scraped together a bunch of talking points, and they're trying to, uh, I think, turn the public away from the benefits of LNG. And, and just briefly, you know, why LNG? Why natural gas? So in the last 10 years... The United States has been quite successful in lowering its national uh, emissions from the the electricity generation space. And they've done that by adopting natural gas as the reliable alternative. They've also introduced a lot of wind. They brought in a lot of solar. And they have some places in the southwest of the U.S. that are just splendid for solar. Uh, unlike, say, Prince Rupert, you wouldn't put solar in Prince Rupert, it's not a place for it. But, hey, you could have an LNG terminal in that area because that's a perfect place for it. Um, we, we've seen, uh, I, I think, the same appetite in China for LNG. The same thing. They want to lower the emissions from their existing electricity consumption, which is growing super fast. India, same thing. They're just, they're, they're so hungry for for energy that's affordable and reliable and cleaner than the alternatives. And so that's what natural gas represents. In BC, we produce a lot of it. We have capacity to produce a lot more. We get it from northeast BC. And one of the arguments that came up last week, oh, okay, not only is it bad for the climate, but it's it's terrible for the land when you extract it. And I saw one of the charts they used to try to show this, or diagrams. And, you know, I, I think if you... If you think fracking is this uh, horrible, dangerous thing, it probably means that you haven't looked at the uh, the technical side of it because what's happened is over the last 50 years, and fracking has been on that long, wasn't invented last week. It's a technology that uh, you, you drill down through many, many layers of rock. could be a couple of kilometers down. could be five kilometers down. And you fracture or frack the rock down there, and then you let the gas flow up through a cement tube that's been put into place. We have the BC Oil and Gas Commission. They have these watchdogs who make sure that there's no cracks or leaks that can't get in, <clears throat> into the water table. And it's it's tight. It doesn't leak methane. 
And that's what we're doing when, when a new drill, drill uh, operation takes place to, to create a well. Um, the, the newer technology is designed specifically to prevent methane to escape, and that's one of the big the headline things is um, LNG or natural gas is worse than coal because it represents methane escape into the atmosphere. And it's true. It's a fact that methane if it's released in the atmosphere, is worse and more lasting than other kinds of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, that's a fact that I certainly wouldn't dispute. The, the, the real question, though, is, is that methane actually escaping? And can that problem, if it exists, be managed? Um, a couple of years ago, BC natural gas companies were told by the government that they would have to reduce their methane escape by 40%. And at that time, I went to a couple of companies and said, well, that's going to be tough for you. It must be, it must be a real mountain to climb, 40% reduction. They said, no, 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 we got this. How? They have new equipment, new processes, procedures. And, and let's not forget just a basic thing, Jim. If you're losing the natural gas or methane, what are you losing as well? That's money leaking out of your system. So it's just not a smart business thing to allow it to happen. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, I, I think an attempt to try to distort the, the whole public, uh, dialogue on this because w- we've seen there's so many reasons why natural gas is a desirable, safer alternative. And of course there are issues that have to be managed, but the evidence is, and, and the BC government, uh, the NDP Green government is highly supportive of natural gas, so much so that they approved the LNG Canada project, $40 billion investment, we know the BC government's got the Clean BC plan. They've they've demanded that there be all kinds of measures, I mean, just a long list of measures that they're enforcing to make sure that the claims about natural gas are backed up by the government. So uh, this is a good situation, and I think it's disappointing. There are so many people in the north of BC who have been so excited at finally a glimmer of economic hope there. We've seen all the, the mills being closed. We've seen this... this uh, situation unresolved on caribou uh, all around the interior that has a lot of people very upset it's causing a lot of turmoil and grief including for for the provincial government not not easy to deal with uh, respect to those who are working their way through it but bottom line is you've got families who are trying to keep it together in places of bc and lng is helping them to do that and it's good for the planet too so uh this is a win for bc NDP leader Jagmeet Singh, the federal NDP leader, is against fossil fuel of any kind. Is he out of step with his union uh, backers? Yeah, so far they seem to be keeping it together. I mean, uh, this is a this is an area that uh, is is very political. I, I think it uh, is one that, that lots of people are looking at. I would imagine that for anyone who's concerned with having good union jobs to build pipelines and get commodities safely to where they need to go you know they're they're interested in making sure that can get done and uh i'm mean, i'm sure they 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 always appreciate when leadership is in support of their goals stuart thank you so much for chatting with us thank you jim my guest has been Stuart Muir, Executive Director of the Resource Works Society. His website, resourceworks.com. If you have any questions for Stuart or any of our other guests, you can send them to info at howstreet.com. Find us on Twitter at Howstreet, our YouTube channel, Talk Digital Network. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.